The next item of business is consideration of business motion 1542 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on changes to the business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button now. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you very much, President Officer, and formally moved. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 1542 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is topical questions. In order to get in as many people as possible, succinct questions and responses would be appreciated. And I call Beatrice Wishart. To ask the Scottish Government what measures public sector agencies, including the Scottish Government, Police Scotland and the Crown Office, will take to increase efforts to ensure women are protected from harassment and violence. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, the Scottish Government works very closely with Police Scotland and the Crown Office to tackle all forms of gender-based violence. Our equally safe strategy maintains a decisive focus on prevention and addressing systemic gender inequalities. We have dedicated £19 million per year through the new Delivering Equally Safe Fund to implement the strategy and in the programme for government, we committed to invest, invest over £100 million to support frontline services and focus on prevention of violence against women and girls. We strengthened our laws to tackle sexual violence, threatening or abusive behaviour, non-consensual sharing of images and domestic abuse. However, recent tragic cases and the experience of far too many women show that more needs to be done. We will therefore consider very carefully the recommendation from Baroness Kennedy's independent working group on misogyny acting swiftly on its advice. And I welcome Police Scotland's message that the onus is on them to provide reassurance to women and their new lone police officer verification process in that regard is very welcome. Beatrice Wishart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response and declare an interest as a board member of Shetland Women's Aid. Violence against women and girls cannot be stripped back to an incident. It is all-consuming in the background of everything that we do. Every day, every minute, we risk assess and change our behaviour in a bid to stay safe. That needs to change. Guidance from the WHO states, despite the fact that violence has always been present, the world does not have to accept it as an inevitable part of the human condition. And it says, the factors that contribute to violence res violent responses whether they are factors of attitude and behaviour or related to larger social, economic, political and cultural conditions can be changed. That is why Scottish Liberal Democrats have been calling for a new commission to work at this scale. This problem cannot be answered through existing strategies. Does the Cabinet Secretary see this need? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say that I certainly agree uh, with the member in relation to the fundamental cultural um, aspect of this. And there is a continuum uh, which is informed by that attitude, which leads from low-level misogyny right through to some of the horrendous crimes that we're all aware of. So I think it's important that um, certainly I concede that there's a need for both uh, the police in this particular case to act, and they've done that, I think, very well in Scotland. There's a need for the government to take forward a number of strategies, some of which I've already mentioned. And there's a need for men in particular, men and boys, in terms of the attitudes which they have to women and girls. And to go back to the point I made before about equally safe at school and Beatrice Wisher's point about how uh, ingrained in society this is. That is why we're tackling gender inequality and gender-based violence at school. Things like teaching, even at primary school level, things like consent, healthy relationships. It's quite clear to me as well that Beatrice Wisher is quite right to say these are ingrained behaviours in women who have had to adapt to the behaviours of men. And it really comes back to men to have to change their attitudes. And I think we're doing that both from an early stage uh, at school and through the other strategies that we are taking forward, some of which I've already mentioned. Beatrice Wishart. If the pervasive threat of violence wasn't enough, the delays in the justice system mean that women suffer in the aftermath too. Research by the Scottish Liberal Democrats identified over 50,000 cases breaching the 26-week timescale between caution and charge before lockdown, and this has clearly been exacerbated by the pandemic. Indeed, one constituent in Shetland will now have their case heard five years after the initial alleged offence occurred. Court budgets operate on a shoestring, and women disproportionately suffer as a result. Many feel that justice is out of grasp. 
How will delays in domestic abuse cases be monitored? And what is the Cabinet Secretary's advice for the many women currently waiting? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, can I say that, first of all, crimes of domestic violence, of course, have a devastating impact on the victims. And we do encourage, not least through the passage of a new law, which has been widely uh, well received, uh, but we encourage women to come forward, uh, or anybody experiencing domestic abuse, to report that and seek support. There is no doubt the pandemic has been challenging in this regard, and it has created a court backlog to a greater extent caused by necessary public health restrictions. And that has been responded to in a number of ways, not least through remote jury centres and the allocation of over £50 million to the court service to make sure that we can get through as many cases as possible. It shows also that while 25 per cent of all summary cases are domestic abuse, 40 per cent of evidence-led trials were, were domestic abuse, which shows, I think, the prioritisation given to domestic abuse cases. As I say, £50 million has already been allocated to our Justice Recovery, Renew and Transform programme, and we will, of course, look to allocate further resources as we can to make sure that back backlog is further reduced. And we do acknowledge the impact it has on domestic abuse victims, but all those within the justice system, including the accused, in terms of these delays. And we want to work down that backlog as quickly as possible. Karen Adam. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle misogynistic behaviour. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, as I said, women and girls in Scotland should feel safe on our streets uh, and public places, and that includes online spaces as well. Uh, that's why we've set up an independent working group on misogyny and criminal justice, chaired by Baroness Kennedy, to independently consider how the Scottish criminal justice system currently deals with misogynistic conduct and if there are gaps in the law that require to be remedied. The group is also looking at whether to add the characteristic of sex to the Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland Act. The working group is currently drawing up a range of evidential sources, including a survey which was filled out by 930 participants, academic evidence and presentations from third sector and justice agencies, including Police Scotland, who will be presenting at the working group meeting this week. The working group is due to report in February 22, and I would not uh, agree with the Prime Minister that it is possible at this stage to rule out the need for a standalone offence of misogyny. Megan Gallagher. Presiding officer. While the tragic case of Sarah Everard has rightly raised concerns about how crimes against women and girls are treated with by the Metropolitan Police, we must also be aware of how such crimes are treated closer to home by Police Scotland and other public bodies. What is clear is that had such a heinous crime taken place in Scotland, Scottish judges would not have been able to hand down a whole life sentence, meaning families could be left worrying that the perpetrator could be released years later. Therefore, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary whether he has reconsidered introducing whole life custody orders in light of recent events? Cabinet Secretary. I think as things stand, we believe that the courts do have the ability to uh, have extended sentences in cases where they think that is appropriate. I would say, of course, we are continuing to have the dialogue and other members within the Members' Party have put the case uh, in debates and, of course, we will listen to those. But as things stand, we believe that the courts in Scotland have the ability, especially in cases uh, as grave as the one that has been mentioned, to hand down appropriate sentences. I think it is possibly also true and quite right to say that the sentence handed down by the court in England reflected the fact it was a police officer that contributed that. So if we, as we often do, I think we share the view across this chamber that we should protect police officers because they hold a position of particular vulnerability by the job they do. We should also make sure that we recognise the fact they hold a position of trust and authority. So when they breach that, that they get a, a sentence which is commensurate with that breach as well as for the substantive crime. So we will continue, of course, as always, to keep these under review, but we currently believe the courts do have the powers that are required in Scotland. Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that comments made by the North Yorkshire Police Commissioner, which blamed Sarah Everard for her murder by saying she should never have been arrested and submitted to that, were completely inappropriate? And does he agree that we should never blame women or leave it up to women to fix the problem of male violence when, for change to happen, it needs to be accepted by everyone? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, I, I would completely agree. I think my former comments, uh, uh, previous answers, uh, reflects that position. The member is absolutely right. We should never blame, of course, uh, any victim of crime uh, for that crime. Uh, and for far too long, we have pushed the burden of responsibility in crimes of this nature onto women to keep themselves safe. Uh, and that needs to change. And for that reason, of course, I do not agree with the comments made. I think the First Minister also made very clear that she did not agree with those comments either. It is quite frankly men's violence against women, and it is the behaviours of men that we require to focus our attentions on, which is also what I think informed the police's response in Scotland. Instead of talking about waving down a bus, they made sure that the onus in their new procedure is put on the police and not on somebody that may be confronted by a lone police officer. That's the right way to do it. But I certainly agree with the member. The last thing we should be doing is blaming victims for the crimes which are perpetrated against them. Pauline McNeill. I sincerely welcome the Cabinet Secretary's comments at the weekend when he said that women should be included as a protected group within the hate crime legislation. It would be a very important signal that these behaviours are not acceptable in society from men. I do appreciate that the Cabinet Secretary was not the Justice Cabinet Secretary when the legislation was passed earlier this year, but the Scottish Government chose not to adopt an amendment which would have included women specifically in the legislation. So I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary now thinks it is time to act and not wait until next year for the findings of the working group on misogyny, as clearly he agrees it is obvious that it should have been included in the hate crime legislation in the first place. Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say that I think it is always very important when we look to bring laws in, into this chamber that we have the correct diligence done in terms of consulting with uh, both experts and others. And I think it is right that, and I, I know that was done in terms of the hate crime bill, but it is also true to say that in terms of uh, a standalone offence of misogyny, uh, it was agreed by the Parliament we should look at this further. Now, I have spoken along with other ministers, with Baroness Kennedy on a number of occasions. I am satisfied she is making very good progress in relation to this, and I think it would be wrong to try and preempt that. We are now a very short time away from her coming to conclusions. I understand that she will also consult with the Justice Committee of this Parliament, so Paul McNeill will have a chance to discuss this directly with her. So I think that is the right way to go about things, in order that we can make sure that if we are to legislate further, we do so on the basis of the evidence uh, that she has taken and the consultation process that has been undertaken as well. Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned that Police Scotland has said the onus is on them to provide reassurance to members of the public, particularly women, that they are acting lawfully. Can I ask what other actions the Cabinet Secretary thinks Police Scotland should be doing to ensure the recent reported cases and allegations of sexual violence in other police forces are not repeated within Police Scotland, and whether he has any concerns about members of Metropolitan Police's Parliamentary and Dip Diplomatic Protection Command joining Scottish officers during COP26? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I should say that I spoke to the Chief Constable a number of times uh, over the last few days, uh, and one of those times was when he was actually at the Met talking with um, the Commissioner of Metropolitan Police, uh, amongst other things, about uh, COP26. Uh, what I can say to provide some reassurance to the member is that the Police Constable has made absolutely clear to the assistance that we will receive from other parts of the UK that when they come uh, to help out in terms of COP26, they will be under the direction of the Chief Constable and they will be following the procedures that we follow in Scotland. So that should provide uh, some reassurance. It is also true to say that Police Scotland, for their part, have changed their vetting procedures. There is now a, almost like a double hurdle to be climbed in terms of vetting to get entry to become a police officer in Scotland. But there is more to do, as the member suggests. If you look at the recommendations made by Dame Eilish Angelini, a number of things, for example, uh, the uh, barred list of former police Police officers that have been um, taken out of the service for reasons of misconduct. There is more to do in relation to uh, that in Scotland. It is not possible, of course, to rejoin the Police Scotland if you have been barred from Police Scotland, but the possibility that you could join Police Scotland from another force from which you have been barred is something that we are very alive to. So there is more to be done, but there is a great deal being done, not least through the work of Ailey Sangelini, some of whose recommendations are currently being taken forward by the police and in relation to vetting and in relation to conduct within the police force itself. So I would hope that would provide some reassurance to the member. <laughs>